What's cracking, everybody? Whether you're joining us on YouTube, whether you're joining us via the podcast, welcome by to the HQ. Jamans Nicholas representing Big Dogs. Gotta eat fantasy football, BDGE. We're getting into rankings. Super Bowl's done with. 2018 season is in the rear view. It's never too early to look at 2019. It's never too early to start talking about next year because you know what? This is becoming a year-round sport. Fantasy football, yeah, it's a sport. Yeah, we are athletes out here. Hard goddamn work. Blood, sweat, tears, years. Fantasy football, my top running back rankings. We're going with the top 10 right now because y'all know I like to get very in-depth, very analytical, and very statistically driven. So this one might take a while to talk about only 10 people, but I want to give you the pros, the cons of every running back in the top 10, along with why I would take this guy over this guy or that guy over the other guy. You all know what it is. So if you enjoy the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we're doing fantasy football content for the 2019 season, dynasty leagues, redraft leagues, keeper leagues, whatever you want, all winter, spring, and summer. Subscribe, hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. Drop a comment down below if you agree or disagree with what I say, which I assume will be a lot of those disagreements because y'all are wild on YouTube, but I appreciate every one of your comments. Anyways, let's get into the video. All right, so admittedly, I wrote this blog post a couple weeks ago prior to the entire NFL playoffs happening, right? I wanted to get it out as soon as the season ended because I felt like we had a good grasp on the rankings for next year after 17 weeks of the regular season. However, that was not the case for the 101. A couple weeks ago, I had Todd Gurley easily cemented into that 101 spot. However, this playoff, this 2018-19 NFL playoff stretch has not given me a lot of confidence in that. And I actually went on the... Fade the Public podcast last night we filmed for this week's video. Stay tuned for that. It's coming out Thursday or Friday. Super Bowl recap, favorite commercials, all that good stuff. I moved Saquon Barkley up to the 101. And I'm going to break down both players and you guys can kind of decide what you want. Todd Gurley was a no-brainer for me. But given that Saquon Barkley is pretty much already the best running back in the history of the NFL, it's going to be hard to fade him if you do have the 101. In fantasy points per game this year, just the regular season, of course, because we're only going by fantasy schedules, Gurley was a full 3.1 fantasy points per game in half PPR better than Saquon Barkley. He finished the year with 1,831 yards from scrimmage, which is 131 yards from scrimmage per game, would have crushed the 2,000-yard mark for the second straight year if he had played the full 16-game slate, which he didn't, of course, but the TD numbers were what did it for him again. I'm talking about Gurley. 21 total touchdowns this year from Gurley without playing in 16 full games. That's one and a half touchdowns per game, which is insanity, which is ridiculous, right? And those aren't fluky behind this Rams offensive line, which has been one of the top lines in the NFL for back-to-back years now. Uh, They ranked as the NFL's number one run blocking line per both Pro Football Focus and Football Outsiders a year after being top five by both platforms as well in 2017. So back-to-back years of absolutely elite offensive line play, which has led us to Gurley having these dominant years. As you can see, they throw C.J. Anderson in there. He has just as much success going back to the point that running backs in the NFL literally don't matter, but they do matter very, very, very much in fantasy football. Now, Gurley dominates goal line touches, which makes him so, so, so valuable in this offense, which scores a lot of points, right? They were first in the NFL in scoring 2017, second only behind the Chiefs in 2018. They're by the end zone all the time. A lot of y'all get hyped about CJ Anderson. I get it. He's a free agent. They want to bring him back. Uh, Listen, CJ Anderson is, is a meatball. He's a meatball parm sandwich. Meatball parm sandwiches don't eat. They get eaten. This is Gurley's backfield for now. He dominates by the goal line, right? He He's led the NFL in goal line rushes, in rushes inside the 10-yard line, and rushes inside the red zone in both 2018 and 2017. And he's also so valuable is his receiving numbers, right? They use him so much in the passing game, but they really got away from that towards the end of the year. And they started just going strictly towards the ground. And that's not what makes a fantasy running back so valuable. What I will say is this, like Gurley ended the year with this injury, right? This knee bothering him and we don't really know what the actual outcome of of this whole knee injury was right I don't think we're going to get a straight answer from either of them they said he was healthy but if they look back and they say Gurley's had you know 650 700 touches over the last two years wasn't healthy for the playoffs 
in 2019, do we scale back the workload a little bit, right? Do we say, you know, let's limit his touches during the regular season because our offense is good enough to win 12, 13 games, get us into the playoffs, and then have our stud running back healthy for the playoffs? Do we, do we, you know, take him back from 23, 25 touches a game down to 17, 18, get someone else in here like a TJ Yeldon who's a free agent or someone like that and have him spell touches because we want him healthy for the playoffs. I know, I know Gurley's a great three down back. He could play every down. He can catch passes. He can block. He can run inside, outside, whatever. You need him healthy for the playoffs. So if they come out in the offseason, right? McVay says, you know, Gurley's had so much work on his legs in the last couple of years that we kind of want to scale back during the regular season so he is healthy for um, for the NFL playoffs, that's that's a big concern for Gurley. He's a lock pretty much to finish the top three fantasy running back if they don't bring anyone else in. He has that 20-plus touchdown upside. I'm not going to say it's his floor, obviously, but he's done it pretty much in back-to-back years. So touchdown upside is very much there. If you want to still take him at the 101, following this playoffs, I think it's a little bit risky. If you have a guy like Barkley at 101, it's going to be very very hard not to take him. You look at Saquon Barkley. You look at Baquan. Baquan Sparkly, as we like to call him there. If he did what he did in 2018 in a bad offense with Eli behind the 26th ranked run blocking line per Football Outsiders as a rookie, imagine what he does with even a fraction of upgrades at any of those pieces of the offense, of the equation there. The way I look at it is this, right? Baquan had what, like 15 touchdowns, so many, just a ridiculous amount of yards from scrimmage, over 2,000, the third rookie running back ever to eclipse the 2,000 yard from scrimmage mark. And when all is said and done with Saquon Barkley, whatever his best statistical season is of his career is going to be a fantasy league winning season, right? Whatever year Saquon Barkley has his best statistical season, and it definitely was not his rookie year. He has incredible years to come. Whatever year that is going to be will be the year that anyone who owns him in fantasy football is going to win their league. So, that being said, I don't know if I want to fade Barkley knowing that if I skip him on his best year ever, you're not going to win the league. You know what I mean? So, originally when I wrote this post, like I said, I had Gurley at the 101, and the reason is because I I took David Johnson in many leagues last year. My brain is like, you have to be risk-averse now. Don't take Barkley because he's in the very same situation as David Johnson. Bad quarterback, bad offensive line, blah, 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 blah. But now I wouldn't say Gurley is, is completely safe either, given how this year ended. So Barkley just being so involved and being such a home run player, right? He had uh, a run of 40 plus yards in seven of their games. So every other game, he's giving you a monster play. And a lot of those are going to end up being touchdowns because people can't catch him on the field. So next year, you're going to get five or six runs individually that go for like 60 yard touchdown runs. And those are I'm not going to say weak winning, but he'll probably also pad those games with other stats that will be weak winning. So that being said, as of right now, as of February 5th, Saquon Barkley is my 101. Todd Gurley is probably my 102. I also think that between these next four running backs from the 103 all the way to the 106, these guys are pretty much interchangeable and it'll come down pretty much to your league scoring type. In my opinion, like, are you going to fade Christian McCaffrey in full PPR about as much as I fade dollar margaritas at Applebee's. You ain't fading that shit. You know what I mean? You're there every night. You pick and see Mac 103 full PPR every time. He's the 103 and half PPR, which is the only league setting that we acknowledge here. Big dog's got to eat. I'm likely grabbing Ezekiel Elliott at 103. After starting his career, he started with 25 touchdowns in 25 games, right? Every game he was giving you a touchdown. He was giving you a six point floor pretty much to start his career. His touchdown rate dipped a bit, though, in 2018. He only scored nine touchdowns. This was pretty much due to a slow start by the team, but they did a complete 180 spin. Ironically, much like me after Dollar Margaritas at Applebee's. We're doing 180 spins when we're back in the HQ. But the spin came when they acquired Amari Cooper. And if you're looking at these splits, weeks one through eight without Cooper, Zeke's numbers are far inferior to after acquiring Amari Cooper. Look at the receptions, the half PPR numbers, the receiving touchdowns, the targets, the yards, even the rushing attempts went up. So not only was he more involved in the passing game by a large margin, but he was even more involved in the rushing game. His touches went from 22-ish up to 28. If you're getting someone who's getting 28 touches a game and he was averaging about 0.6 touchdowns a game, which is gonna give you about 12 touchdowns on the year, 28 touches a game, you can't argue against that even as the 101. The offense transformed, as did Zeke's production over the second half of the year. He caught a minimum of five passes in every single game starting in week 10. Week 10 on, five passes in every single game. And over the last eight games, he was averaging an absurd 150 yards from scrimmage per game. 
If you pace out, if you take his second half of the season numbers and pace it out to a full 16 games, which is, you know, what the offense can expect in 2018, in my opinion, or 2019 from Zeke, you're looking at a season of 104 receptions just under c uh record-setting year this year, 2,416 total yards from scrimmage, 10 total touchdowns, and 354.2 fantasy points in half PPR, which would beat out both Todd Gurley and Saquon Barkley this year for the running back one. So, Zeke's second half of the year, once they acquired Cooper, was the best fantasy running back in the league. The big difference maker, of course, was his involvement in the passing game. As I said, five passes or more in every game from week 10 on. If that continues, which I don't see why it wouldn't, he's every bit the elite fantasy running back that Gurley or Saquon is. The other thing to take into consideration with Zeke is the offensive line. They've had that elite run blocking line for the last few years, but the health was a big concern this year, right? They had all pro guard uh, Zach Martin miss a few games and he he dipped in production a little bit because he was dealing with this lingering knee injury. Travis Frederick, are arguably the league's best center, missed all of 2018 with that rare disease. He's expected to be back in 2019. His backup, Joe Looney was the 32nd graded center per PFF this year. So you take arguably the best center in the league and you swap out him for Joe Looney, who was the 32nd, which if you do the math, there are 32 teams in the NFL, one starting center per team. You're looking at the worst center in the NFL pretty much per pro football focus. The offensive line still finished as Football Outsiders' eighth best run blocking line and PFF's 13th best. So still a very solid run blocking line for Zeke. Now you're getting these guys back healthy. They're going to be very, very, very good again. Frederick, like I said, is reportedly expecting to return for 2019, which we should probably take with a grain of salt considering we don't know much about this, you know, this this disease and what he's dealing with. But if he is back and you get a fully healthy Zach Martin, it's a huge monster upgrade for that line and for Zeke. And I also want to touch on Gurley. The other reason that I'm putting him back at 102 is two pieces of the offensive line. Roger Saffold, which is a uh, number seven graded pro football focus guard in the entire NFL. So of all the guards in the NFL, he was the seventh best uh, graded out guard this entire year, is a free agent. Who knows if they're going to sign him? Andrew Whitworth is contemplating retirement. He doesn't know if he's going to be back. If they lose one of those pieces, it's going to be a blow to this offensive line. If they lose both of those pieces, do you remember what happened with the Bengals when they lost Andrew Whitworth the first time? Good Lord. So if they lose both, if if Whitworth retires and they lose Saffold to free agency, there's going to be problems in Los Angeles. There are going to be problems, and he would probably fall down to maybe like the 105-ish in my opinion. So right now we have Saquon, Gurley, Zeke. We are up to the 104. A battle of riches pretty much are what fantasy drafters are left with at the 104 pick. And it's it's kind of deciding between C-Mac and Alvin Kamara, who finished as RB3 and RB4 in 2018 fantasy, respectively. I'm leaning towards C-Mac. I actually don't think it's that close just because he is the unquestioned workhorse in Carolina, whereas Alvin Kamara is not really that in New Orleans. C-Mac showed phenomenal durability finishing with 326 touches this year, despite his smaller frame, of course. His 107 receptions was an NFL record for a running back over a season-long period. What that does is is when you get a majority, right, he gets 326 touches, which is not, you know, the NFL lead. There are running backs getting more touches than him, which is fine, because when you're getting a huge portion of those, right, he got nearly 33% of his touches through receptions. That takes away a lot of the wear and tear. Instead of running it up the gut and getting hit by these 350-pound linemen, you're getting the ball in space, you're running out of bounds, or you're seeing the tackler before he can get to you, so you are putting your body in a position as to not take a big hit. So if a lot of your touches are coming by receptions, you are you are essentially getting a lot less wear and tear on your body. And that's the reason why someone as small as C-Mac can prosper and get 325 touches and be fine and show durability. He played on 91% of the Panthers' offensive snaps this year, compared to just 70% from 2017, and he received 95% of the Panthers' running back touches this year, despite not really even playing in Week 17. So he barely played in Week 17, still found wound up with 95% of the Panthers' running back touches this year, which is an unbelievable uh, statistic if you think about it. For any running back to get 95% of the touches is just absurd. And they talked about it all summer, how C-Mac was going to be the guy. And (coughs) listen, when Norv came in, if you looked at his historical coaching data, he was always someone who gave the running back workhorse touches. So it should have been something easy to see. Admittedly, I was not someone who, you know, looked at coaches as a monster, monster piece of fantasy outlooks, but this year was a change. Last week, I did my coaching, all the NFL coaching changes, all the new head coaches, offensive coordinators in their new 
places, new faces, new places, or old faces, new places. Did that video, very in-depth breakdown as well. So if you missed that, I will link it up here as well as down below. So check that out after this one to get you kind of recapped on all the moves around the league. So Norv used him as he used any of his running backs in the past. Most importantly, right, was not only his snaps increased from 70 to 91%, it became that full workhorse, but he was used near the end zone, near the, the tutty zone, the tug zone, if you want to call it. He finished fourth in the entire NFL with 46 red zone carries, fifth with 29 10 zone carries inside the 10 yard line, and seventh with 12 goal line carries. So much talent, so much passing game involvement and now the volume down by the end zone is there there's nothing more you need to look for when it comes to christian mccaffrey so he is my 104 and you could honestly argue him to be with those top picks uh, before we get into kamara if you're enjoying this video guys if you're finding value from it so far uh, all i ask for you is to hit that thumbs up button down below drop a comment what you think of the 101 through the 104 I want to hear your guys' point of view because a lot of times I'll, I'll miss out on some of uh, some of my analysis. I try to give you as much as I can, but you guys also see things from a different perspective. So I'm not someone who thinks I'm always right about everything. I like to hear your input. So drop a comment down below while you're down there. Hit that thumbs up. If you're listening via podcast, guys, all it does, all it takes is for you to like scroll up a tiny bit, leave a rating and review. That would be much appreciated because obviously I put a lot of time and effort into these. And I told you this was going to be a long one. We're only four. Uh, running backs through, and we're probably about 20 minutes in. This will be the top 10 running backs, guys. I'm only going to do the top 10. If you want my top 25, I am going to give you those rankings. It will be in the first link down below. I will give you my top 25 running back rankings for early 2019 fantasy football, half PPR, standard, and PPR. Giving you all three formats, my top 25 rankings. All you got to do is hit the link down below. It will be the first link in the description. I'll probably also put it in the comment section. So click that link. Uh, and then you'll figure out how to get them once you're on that page. Top 25 running back, standard, half PPR, full PPR. Go check them out down below. But let's get into the latter half of the top 10 running backs. So you have Kamara, balled out in his second season. He's in one of the best offenses in the NFL behind an elite offensive line. He had 13 touchdowns during his rookie year. And you're like, ah, oh, there's no way he could repeat this sort of efficiency. Well, he added five scores to that 13 touchdown mark, finished with 18 touchdowns in 2018. He hit 80 plus receptions for the second straight year, which seems to be a lock year over year now, given how they use Kamara in this offense all over the field, right? They use him in the slot. They use him out wide. He is always catching passes. So definitely not a fluky thing. You could expect 80 plus catches from Kamara basically year over year at this point. The big variable here, though, is Mark Ingram and where he ends up because he is a free agent this summer. So what do they do? Do they resign him? Both sides said they want to, like, Mark Ingram's like, I would love to finish my career in New Orleans, but clearly they've had some issues over the course of his career. The coaching staff has had issues with Ingram. He's had the suspension to deal with, and uh, there's more behind the scenes that we are not going to know about than the reports that do come out. So Wherever he goes is going to be a big factor in Kamara's outlook. I would expect him not to be given a big contract by New Orleans and end up somewhere else because he's a back that's proven he could play on all three downs. He could run it inside, outside, catch balls, get in on the goal line, and just use on all three downs. So there is going to be a team that will give money to Ingram because he is an older back, but he has he doesn't have that much wear and tear on him right now. That's a million dollar question. Kamara was no me. It was, it was not bad by any means when Ingram did return after his four game suspension, but the splits were pretty staggering when you look at it, right? In the first four games, he was the unquestioned workhorse, giving you 28 half point PBR fantasy points per game. His touches averaged uh, he was getting like 22 and a half touches a game. Once Ingram came back, that dipped down to under 17 touches a game. And the work in the passing game is really, really, really what dipped, dude. Almost 12 targets a game he was getting when Ingram was out. And that dropped down to 5.2. So that is a huge, 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 huge hit to Kamara's usage. And you could say whatever you want, whether it was, you know, he got tired out over the first four games or that's just their best plan to use him. He still gives you that 30 point upside on a week to week basis, regardless of if they have another running back there. But the floor absolutely took a hit. You could tell by the volume, by the production. His playtime obviously did too. His snap percentage over those first four games was at 82%. So he was on the field 82% of the time. Once Ingram returned, that dropped down to 60% snap play. Will they re-sign Ingram? The biggest questions. If they don't, they probably will bring in another running back. I don't really know off the top of my head who would be a good fit here, but I'm sure they could find a guy like Isaiah Crowell would fit that system fine. Someone who's more of like a thumper, who would give you the in-between the tackles runs that they don't want to give Kamara necessarily. Um, 
So I don't see Kamara being the 80 to 90% touch workload guy that you would like to see if you're going to use a top five pick on him. But at the same time, he's good enough to be your top five pick if he's getting 60 to 70% of the touches because his involvement in the passing game is so, 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 so big. And I think the tier kind of drops off in a sense when you get to 106. Melvin Gordon's my 106, and he's just as good as any fantasy running back in the NFL, and just as good as any fantasy option. On a per-game basis, he is up there with Gurley. He's up there with Saquon, but that's a problem. The per-game statistic is where it's going to get you. He's dealt with multi-week injuries now in three of his four NFL seasons. So he's played in four NFL seasons so far. This will be his fifth year in 2019. Multi-week injuries have plagued him in three of those four years. It was two games his rookie year, three games his sophomore year. He played the full... 2017 campaign. Then he missed four games again in 2018. The underlying problem here with those numbers is this. Yes, you might miss three or four games, but you also have to think that those three or four games in which he missed are sandwiched by one, the first game in which he probably got injured and gave you a dud. And then once you come back, once you come back from that injury, right? Once you're back from a multi-week injury, he probably gives you less production in that game back. Right, So he likely left that first game early and then comes back and doesn't get as big of a workload. And I say that because I back it up with the big facts only. I did a little deep dive, as you can see by this Twitter this Twitter tweet that I twatted out. Go follow me on Twitter if you are not already doing so, Nick underscore BDGE. Just a little deep dive on the top 36 fantasy football running backs from 2018 who had multi-week injuries. In their first game back from injury. Here is the average drop-off in volume relative to their individual season averages. So I found every running back that finished as a top 36 fantasy running back in 2018 that had multi-week injuries. What I included in that was anyone who missed all of preseason as well as week one. That would count as a multi-week injury as well as coming back from a multi-week suspension. So we had a 15 running back sample size, which is a pretty good sample size of just 36 of the top running backs, right? So 15 of the 36 missed multi-weeks. And I looked at their first game back from that multi-week injury. Rush attempts, rush yards, targets, receptions, and snaps played all dropped by at least 13%. And their their involvement in the passing game, which was probably the biggest drop-off, you could see targets went down by 18%, receptions went down by 21%, their snap percentage went down by 28%. So once they come back, they're not getting as, as involved in the offense, at least in that first game. It's not saying over the rest of the year that they're not involved just as much as they were, But that first game back, so what I'm saying is if you miss three games, you're likely impacted by almost five games. The game before that three-game stretch and the game after it when they come back. So that's like the deeper theory here to it. And, you know, sportsinjurypredictor.com, which I found to be creepily accurate over the year, projects him to miss in 2019 2.3 games. And we actually have a a staggering injury once we get to the wide receiver rankings, which is going to drop on Friday, I believe. So stay tuned for that. Again, guys, if you're not already subscribe to the channel. Make sure you do so because we're going to be hitting you with big facts only this entire offseason. Sportsinjurypredictor.com, like I said, predicts injuries. And over the last, you know, five years or whatever, they've been really accurate. Like I did not, I was like, this is fluky. I would never listen to this. They're going to predict injuries, but they've been very, very, very good. Just take my word for it, guys. I'm not going to like lie to you and give you bullshit. They've been very good at predicting around, you know, what players are going to get injured, injured, who are the high injury risk, what number of games are going to miss. So they have inflated to miss over two games. Like I said, if they're missing multi-weeks, they're going to hit you on both ends. So that is the only, the only problem I see with Melvin Gordon. That's why I take him at the 106 because he has not shown durability over the years. When he's on the field, he's fantastic. When he's on the field, that is the big issue here. So Melvin Gordon comes in at the 106. Before we head into the 107, I want to talk about Le'Veon Bell. Because I know a lot of y'all are going to start yelling at me in the comments section about how he's a top 10 pick. He is not in my top 10 rankings. He's not in my top 10 running back rankings right now. Maybe when he finds a team, he will be, depending on where he lands. He will be in my top 25, of course. And again, if you want my my full list, top 25 running back rankings, half PPR, full PPR standard, the first link down below in the description will get you there or in the comments section. Le'Veon Bell, I, you know, as I as I usually do, I just want to like improv and, and look on some different websites and talk about where he might end up. Now I'm looking on mybookie.ag, which is the sports book that I use, and the Jets are the favorite to land him at plus 300, which um, is not that. I mean, it's the favorite in terms of the rest of the teams, but that does not mean that the Jets are uh, a good bet necessarily to land him. Plus 300 means that you would have to bet that you would get $300 from a $100 bet. 
So it's tripling your money, which means it's you know three times less likely that'll happen, whatever. Jets are plus 300, the Raiders are plus 500, the Eagles are plus 700, Bucks plus 700, Packers plus 750, 49ers plus 900, Colts plus 900, Ravens as well, Houston Texans plus 1200. So you have a, a few teams on here, and I think the Jets probably makes the most sense because they have the cap space. The Raiders make sense too because Beast Mode's probably not going to be back, and they need a running back. The Eagles as well. They clearly you know, can't rely on Jay Ajayi, and they don't really have a great mix of guys back there. There's a problem here. If he lands on any of those teams, he is not going to be the top five fantasy running back that he's been. The Jets, for one, they signed Adam Gase, who clearly has no idea how to fucking use running backs based on what he did in Miami. The Jets' offense is just not good overall. They don't throw to their running backs anywhere near as much as the Steelers did. Uh, the Raiders are just, you know, a bad offense as well. And I have no faith in Le'Veon Bell getting near the end zone that much. Philadelphia Eagles, Doug Peterson has proven that he will never use a feature running back. He is always a by-committee guy. So all of these top teams that he lands on are not great offenses. I would like to see him at Tampa Bay, which is plus 700 with Bruce Arians, that would be that would actually be a nice fit. That's someone who I could see him ranking in the top 10 if he lands there. But Bell's coming off a full year of not playing. He's older now. Obviously, there's going to be less tread on the tires. He's rested, but like still, he missed a lot of time. And he's going to come back and probably be on one of these bad offenses. So right now, of course, this is going to change dramatically depending on where he lands and where he ends up. If he ends up on the Colts, that would be pretty cool. I don't know why they would do that after what Marlon Mack showed. But if he ends on the Bucks, that would be a great landing spot. If you do think any of these are great values, or if you want to bet on the 2020 Super Bowl, uh, winner, you can go to my bookie. They are a partner for today's video, mybookie.ag. This will also be linked down below. You will get a 50% deposit bonus. So if you deposit hundred bucks, they will give you $50 on top of that to bet with. If you use the promo code BDGE, I know they're still working to get that into the situation. So if BDGE does not work, then use promo code myb 50 So M-Y-B and then the numbers 50. That will give you a 50% percent deposit bonus if you use the link down below so bell is not in my top 10 he will be in the top 25 like i mentioned 17 times already move on to the 107 and this is where things i think will really drastically differ from person to person my 107 is nick chubb it was james connor but i moved him down just i, I just don't like the situation there in pittsburgh if and so uh, we'll get to him and i feel like a fucking airport security person like take your shoes off take your laptop off take your laptop out the bag just saying the same shit over and over again but this is a very tough pick here at the 107 this is a tough pick you can go either way right i keep repeating that over and over again i'm gonna go nick chubb brown starting running back dominated the backfield once carlos hyde was traded to the jaguars for when he was handed the starting job in week seven through the rest of the season chubb 797 rushing yards trailed only ezekiel elliott for the nfl lead from that point on what concerns me about Chubb is his involvement in the passing game or his lack of involvement. He had a 6.5% target share at Georgia, 13 catches over, combined 34 games for the Bulldogs. So that is what really scares me about a guy like Nick Chubb. And, you know, I've talked about how you don't want to grab guys who are not involved in the passing game, especially if you are in a PPR league, right? If your fantasy league is a PPR formatted, those are guys you want to stay away from because they be, they could be game scripted out. When he took over as the starter in Cleveland last year, he caught only 20 passes over the final 10 games. And it's very hard to find success as a fantasy running back if you're not catching 40 passes in a year, right? 40 or more passes is probably the threat threshold for you to really crack that like elite fantasy running back. Chubb does have a lot of things working in his favor though. He has a full summer now preparing as a starter with Baker Mayfield under center. Freddie Kitchens is taking over as the head coach and Todd Monk God as the offensive coordinator. I absolutely love Cleveland's offensive setup in terms of coaching and personnel in 2019. I expect the game script to be, if not very favorable, at least good for Nick Chubb, right? I don't expect them to be the Browns of old where they're always trailing and trying to come back. I, I could see them being in the game for the very, very large majority of their games, right? And I could see Nick Chubb being on the field for the very large majority of the snaps, which would be phenomenal considering how good he ran the ball so if he's on the bat if he's on the field for the majority of snaps overall along with getting the running work he's going to be a stud he finished the year as pro football focus's most elusive running back in the nfl per pro football focus literally the most elusive running back in the nfl second highest grade for a running back overall behind only melvin gordon he has a 90th percentile end up athlete when it comes to weight adjusted speed score burst score his strength on the bench press and a spark athlete all around, Nick Chubb is a guy who there's no way he will fail outside of injury. Chubb finished four yards shy of 1,000 rushing yards despite getting only 16 rushing attempts in their first six games. We're going to go back to when he took over as the starter again, right? Starting in week seven, Chubby went 
full salute, full erection. I'm going to really try to withhold from making corny boner jokes about Chubb this offseason. But from week seven on, Chubb's NFL ranks. Third in rush attempts, second in rushing yards, 12th in yards per carry of all running backs with over 100 carries, second in yards after contact per attempt, first in total evaded tackles, and eighth in fantasy points. So he he finished as the eighth best fantasy running back despite really not being that involved in the passing game. AKA, he's very good. What I noticed was this. Looking at this chart, I wanted to see like what are the chances that Duke Johnson kind of gets phased out of the offense or he gets used differently so that Nick Chubb can be used more in the passing game. Weeks one through six, when uh, Chubb was not their starting running back and when Kitchens was not calling the plays yet, right? You see Duke Johnson was lining up in the slot or out wide on 4.8 snaps per game and 28 snaps a game from the backfield. Now, if you look at week 7 through 17, his numbers nearly doubled for slot and wide receiver snaps and almost, you know, half themselves for backfield snaps. So if Kitchens used him like he did last year over the second half of the year, right, two times as much as in the slot and half as much in the backfield, Chubb can stay on the field in the backfield way more with Duke Johnson in the slot or in the backfield or out wide, which means Chubb's going to be involved in the passing game just as much as Duke Johnson probably is. So it's not one or the other. And that's really where, you know, that's really why I I like Chubb because I think there's so much room for improvement for this upcoming year. And I think the Browns are just going to take a monster step forward and Chubb is going to be a big reason why. Chubb gets a 107. James Conner gets the 108. James Conner scares the shit out of me, right? Scares me in the way that a a spicy Chick-fil-A sandwich scares me. I am not good with spicy foods. There is a very low floor when it comes to me eating spicy foods. If it's just a kick of spice, this could be a game changer. This could be a league winner. A spicy chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A that's not too spicy can be incredible. Enter James Conner, stage left. He scares me in that his range of outcomes for the 2019 fantasy football season is all over the place, right? He has the ceiling of a phenomenal Chick-fil-A sandwich, but if he's too spicy and say he gets hurt or Jalen Samuels gets more involved in the backfield, you're left hungry and you're left unfed. I'm sorry, that was like a fucking horrible description or analysis of that, but that's not kind of how I look at it, man. I love Chick-fil-A, but they be fucking me up with them spicy shits. James Conner was undoubtedly the workhorse in 2018 for the Steelers, right? Thanks to Le'Veon Bell's $14 million vacation, if you want to put it at that. If the Steelers commit to Conner as their workhorse in 2019 and he stays healthy, you're getting a legitimate fantasy stud and a real running back one. However, I do see some red flags with Conner. And, you know, I always like to point out not only the positive, but the negatives of all of these top guys. One is his health, right? He tore his MCL in 2017, which led to him missing the last four games of the season. Then he dealt with lower leg and concussion injuries in 2018, which forced him to miss another three games. And like I kind of said with Melvin Gordon, right? The multi-week injuries can actually be more impactful than just those games missed. His injury history during his NFL in, in the NFL is at least a minor concern, if not a real concern for a guy like James Conner. Second, do we see the Steelers split the backfield more in 2019? Instead of giving Conner 90% of the snaps and touches like he got this year while he was their starter, do things change in that backfield? Does Jalen Samuels fill in like he did this year, you know, over that three game stretch when he was pretty effective? And when Conner returned in week 17, Jalen Samuels was much more involved in the passing game than James Conner was. Samuels got eight targets and caught seven passes. Conner only saw three targets that game. So even when he was back in full health, right, and this could be a thing of, you know, first game back from the multi-week injury, but Jalen Samuels was still very involved in the passing game. And I could totally see Samuels' receiving role increasing in 2018, given Antonio Brown might not be there. My thinking is that it does. And that's because of a a low-key, under-the-radar coaching move that they made. And I talked about this in the coaching changes uh, video that I made last week. The Steelers hire NC State tight ends and fullbacks coach and special teams coordinator Eddie Faulkner as a new running backs coach. He was the coach for Jalen Samuels, while Jalen Samuels was at NC State. Samuels led that team in receptions over that span with 202 career receptions. So this guy already knows Jalen Samuels, very familiar with him, very familiar with his capabilities and what he could do in an offense, which tells me that they're almost 100% going to use Jalen Samuels. And my other problem with James Conner is I just don't think he's that great of a running back, right? You watch Kamara, you watch Zeke, you watch Saquon Barkley, and you're like, damn, these guys are really good running backs, like really talented. I don't get that feeling from James Conner. If we're being honest here, right? He does have some highlight plays for sure. Um, and, and he does make some awesome plays, but in terms of most of the time, his average run in terms of creating yards, his elusiveness, making guys miss. eh, you know, that, that was what I saw when I watched James Conner, when I watched a lot of his plays, I went back and watched a lot of his film last year. Cause I wanted to confirm that, right? It was my feeling. It was a thought I had when I watched James Conner and I wanted to make sure that 
That's what I saw in film as well. And I started diving into the numbers. Here's what I found. I'm just going to read these stats off. Per player profiler, yards created per carry ranked 38th among running backs. His PFF rushing grade was 26th. He was 26th in yards after contact and 20th per PFF in tackles evaded per attempt. So like I said, it's what I saw in film and then the numbers back that up. So if Connor isn't used as a full-time back in Pittsburgh, I worry he could wind up being an RB2, right? He could wind up being like this year's David Johnson, if you want to put it that way, with some big time busty games in 2019. And you don't want that with your first round pick. So I think James Conner is pretty risky as a first round pick. And I actually might move this next guy up above him. And that's Joe Mixon, right? He broke out in 2018. He played in just as many games in 2018, 14 as he did in 2017. But all of his statistics took a major spike in production. 280 catches or 280 touches, excuse me, 1,464 yards from scrimmage. So he would have hit that 300 mark. 1,500 yards from scrimmage, probably 1,600 yards from scrimmage, and double-digit touchdowns. He wound up with nine this year. Finished his fantasies running back nine. Looked like a fucking meatball, man, in, in, in 2017. He dropped some weight and became way more explosive and shifty, resulting in 4.9 yards per carry this year, ranked seventh among running backs with at least 140 carries, which is 31 running backs. He had 20 carries of 15-plus yards this year which was second in the NFL. And again, he only played in 14 games. He showed good consistency throughout the year and he exploded down the stretch, averaging 21.3 touches a game, 117 yards from scrimmage per game, scoring three times over the final six weeks of the season, which was fantasy's running back six. I do, of course, have my concerns when it comes to Mixon. And I'll lay out the big facts like I do with all of these, the good and the bad, unbiased for y'all. Their offensive line is still very bad. It barely improved in 2018. And that was one of the key points that I had on Joe Mixon, right? I remember... Joe Mixon was one of my my breakout running back candidates for the 2018 season, right? The, the video I made last summer, which I had Joe Mixon on the list, Sonny Michelle on the list, and uh, Jarek McKinnon prior to him getting injured in the summer. So we hit on, if you don't count on uh, on uh, on Jarek McKinnon, then we hit 100% of my breakout running back picks. But one of my key pieces of analysis was, you know, they, they used a first round pick on their center. They signed a couple guys in the off season to boost that offensive line. Joe Mixon dropped weight. So the dropped weight thing, I think was a very impactful thing. Their offensive line, as you can see by this chart, was still very bad. They went from 28th down to 26th in run blocking per PFF, 24th down to 22nd per football outsider. So they're still going to need to improve that offensive line. I'm also not sure what to make of their coaching moves, right? They, they, I'm happy. As a Bengals fan, I'd be very happy. As a fantasy owner of Joe Mixon, I would also be happy that they finally got rid of extra medium Marvin. Marvin Lewis is out of Cincinnati. But now we have a former wide receivers assistant coach, quarterback coach, taking over as their head coach and another quarterback coach as their OC. How effective is this offense going to be behind guys who have never even coordinated an offense, really? I do want to show you this chart. Their offense has been completely stagnant in terms of pace and in terms of plays. If you look at this chart, really what it does is the number of offensive plays run per team, right? You have 2018, you have 2017, along with the rank that year. And then the biggest difference year over year in terms of offensive plays ran. Cincinnati is about, I don't know, the 14th team down the list. And in 2017, they ran 927 offensive plays, which was 32nd in the NFL. This year, they improved by 11 plays. So they ran 938 plays were still ranked 29th in the NFL. So they were not running anywhere near enough offensive plays to really have that type of volume in Cincinnati. And Mixon still got a really heavy workload. Per football outsider, Cincinnati ranked 31st in total time of possession per drive as an offense, 30th in yards per drive, 28th in, I wrote PPD. I don't even know what that means. Points, oh, points per drive. There we go, Nicholas. So 31st in time of possession, 30th in yards per drive, 28th in points per drive. They don't run any goddamn plays, so it can't get much worse. Mixon is a high floor, high ceiling player, though, that I I would love to grab in the second rounds of draft. He's probably going to have a big year in 2019 and then be a top six or seven pick in 2020. That's kind of how I look at Mixon. We'll also see what happens with Gio, who is an unrestricted free agent this summer. If they can get Mixon more involved in the passing game, he very well might finish as a top five fantasy running back. Both the new head coach and offense coordinator come from offenses in the Los Angeles Rams and the Oakland Raiders that use their running back pretty heavily in the passing game. So we'll have to see. That is where I see uh, Joe Mixon as the running back. Oh no, the rankings actually, I'm sorry, flip that. So I, I moved Joe Mixon up to running back eight, James Conner to running back nine, and rounding out the list, running back 10, This hurts my heart. And guys, again, if you've gotten value so far from this video, all I ask is that you uh, drop a a thumbs up down below. 
Leave a rating and review on the podcast. Very much appreciated. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you want the top 25 running back rankings, link down below. Running back 10. David Johnson. I'm my, I was I was debating putting him at like running back 24 because I hate this motherfucker. But I guess for a specimen like himself, there's really nowhere to go but up after where he finished in 2018. Or so so I've been told, right? That's going to be the analysis. 2018 was a year of forget for DJ. And DJ honestly might forget it just by default because he might possibly have CTE after just literally getting a run up the middle, play after play after play, and hitting his head against these linemen. Because Mike McCoy was literally the worst fucking play caller of Steve Wills, all these fucking guys. First and 10, run up the middle. Hit your head against the offensive line and fall down for a one-yard gain. Getting rid of Bruce Arians and bringing on the combination of Steve Wilkes and Mike McCoy might have proved to be the worst hire in the history of professional football. We take a look at the chart above, right? The plays chart that I mentioned with Joe Mixon. Arizona went from running the fifth most plays in the NFL in 2017 to dead last in 2018. 1,060 plays in 2017, 902 plays. So you're seeing a 160 play drop off, which would probably result if David Johnson is getting, you know, 30% of the team's touches, that's an extra 50 or 60 touches on the year, which is a huge, huge, huge increase in production. They ranked 19th in pace. So that's seconds in between plays. Dead last in terms of pace when trailing by a touchdown or more. Like, why the fuck are you just taking your sweet time when you're trailing and you're getting your ass kicked? So horrible, just horrible coaching there. Many of the concerns about David Johnson entering 2018 will still manifest into his 2019 fantasy outlook, in my opinion. Still a very shaky offensive line. If we're being generous, they rank 25th in run blocking and 26th in run blocking per football outsiders and PFF respectively. A bad situation there for any running back. Now, if you look at their offensive linemen individually, per their PFF grades in 2018, you have DJ Humphreys, left tackle, ranked 40th among tackles. Mike Eupati, 32nd among guards. Mason Cole, 34th among centers. Right guard, it was a mix between Justin Pugh and Oday Abuzi. I don't know, 42nd and 66th among guards. John Wetzel's at right tackle, 72nd among tackles. So you had no one inside the top 30 ranking inside their position. Not a single good player on their offensive line. And that's hard to do it, even if you tried. So the Cardinals do have the 11th most cap space available in this offseason. And they obviously have the first pick overall in this year's draft, along with a pick in every round thereafter. So that needs to be something they address right off the back. If they're smart, they're going to move back, right? If they believe in Josh Rosen, which they obviously do after drafting him in the first round, they're going to trade back from that 101, give it to someone else, and then get either multiple, you know, a first round, a second round pick, something like that, and then really address this offensive line issue. And like I said, they have money to grab offensive linemen, so maybe they grab Roger Saffield from the from the Rams. Who knows? But that needs to be their first, foremost, you know, priority this offseason. The quarterback situation, again, is another concern. Rosen was horrible in 2018. But if you're going to give DJ a pass and, you know, blame it on the coaches and the line, then I think you have to at least do that with a Josh Rosen. The pass blocking was horrible, arguably worse than the run blocking was. And in terms of we uh, weapons, man, you had like the geriatric Larry Fitzgerald. You had Christian Kirk, who was there for like six games. So he really had nothing to work with. DJ was criminally underused in the passing game. So obviously any bounce back for DJ results in the new coaching staff, right? You have Cliff Kingsbury coming in as a new head coach. So what we get from DJ with Cliffy manning the team, as I like to call him, I'm on a first name basis with him. You know, I listened to one of the Fantasy Footballers podcasts last week, and I believe it was Jason Moore, who actually came on my channel earlier this week. So if you missed that interview, that was awesome. Jason Moore said this. I'm going to read off the quote. Since 2014, Cliff Kingsbury, Cliff Kingsbury's running backs have received 372 targets, which is sixth most in the NCAA. 293 catches, also sixth most in the NCAA. I have a lot of trouble saying sixth. Six most, so 372 targets, 293 catches, six most in the NCAA since 2014. 2,551 receiving yards, fifth most in the NCAA. Love to hear that as a DJ owner. DJ finished as the RB10 in fantasy. So you want to say, oh, not that bad. You know what? He didn't kill your team. But half of his games went for fewer than 12 fantasy points in half-point PPR, which is terrible. So he was not anywhere near returning value from where you picked him last year, probably in the top four picks. I will think about him in the mid to late second round, probably closer to late second round, early third if he drops there. But I would prefer Mixon, and I would definitely prefer one of the elite wide receivers like the Julio Joneses or the Michael Thomas. Or I will probably take Juju Smith-Schuster as well as Travis Kelsey over uh, David Johnson there in the early to mid second round. So David Johnson is a guy that I'm not 
going to get too optimistic about just because Kingsbury came in, but he would round out this because there is definitely room to improve upon last year, of course, if they start using him in the um, in the passing game correctly and they improve that offensive line. So that wraps up the top 10. Again, guys, if you want the top 25, half PPR, full PPR standard, you know where to go. Link down below. First link in the description as well as in the comment section. Go drop a comment down below. I want to hear who you guys have in the top 10, who you agree or disagree with. Who are you taking at 101? It's got to be Barkley now with Gurley out. Thumbs up the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you are new. I love y'all. If you're trying to drop some bets, if you're trying to pay pay the mortgage, make sure you fade the public. Sign up at my bookie using promo code BDGE or myB50 with the link down below. You'll get a 50% deposit bonus. I love y'all. Thank you so much for sticking around. If you did, spending your time with me in this beautiful, beautiful Tuesday morning. I'm about to drink like 13 more cups of coffee and start researching some more big facts for the next video. I'll see y'all on Thursday. Peace. Love you.